on this edition of Native Report. Come with us and experience the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa's annual wild rice celebration in powwow. We then learn about the Bad River Nation's effort to protect the environment in and around the boundaries of their reservation. And we meet Bad River Tribal Chairman Mike Wiggins Jr. We also learn what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this edition of Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation, the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, and the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. Thank you for tuning in. Powwows are social gatherings and most Native nations have at least one celebration that is special to their community. For the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, their wild rice celebration and powwow is a time for friends and family to gather and reaffirm their ties to each other and to Mother Earth and her gifts. Dancers make their way into the Powell Arena on this August afternoon. It is the time of celebration for the Bad River Nation in Wisconsin. As they gather with family, friends, and other guests to celebrate Minomen, our wild rice, the food that grows on water. It's the 40th annual Minomen celebration, Bad River Powell. In our creation story, we talk about traveling where the food grew on water. There's a lot of history with it. Um, it's sacred to our people. We have a really good turnout this year. Um, close to 30 drums and about 500 dancers, close to 500. So it's pretty big this year. And it's actually my first year being on the Powell Committee. So we actually light the fire for the Powell on a Thursday, but we don't have like drumming and dancing. Um, and we did a, a sunrise ceremony for that. And um, we lit the fire and had a little feast and invited other people who carry pipes to come smoke their pipes with us. And uh, that's how we started. We start every year like that. Um, and the, we, all, we have that fire going for four days. Since 1980, the Bad River Minoman Celebration in Traditional Powwow is a public event for the entire family. Minoman, our wild rice, is an integral part of Ojibwe history, and the Bad River Nation celebrates the growth and harvesting of this food staple with traditional dancing, singing, and plenty of food. What would uh, uh, somebody who is unfamiliar with uh, Bad River Powwow, what could they experience when they come here? Um, well, definitely dancing, good music with the drums, um, and lots of stands to be seen, and just a visit with old people. A lot of people come back home to come to our powwow. My aunt is from Tacoma, Washington. That's where I was born too. And she's here this weekend. She came here for the powwow the past two weeks that she's been here. And we wanted her to come here during this time because it's just so much fun. There's so much for her to do. The weather is beautiful. We have the powwow. It's racing season. Actually just opened on Friday. Um, and then we took her to Madeline Island too, which was actually like the original place for people when, to come here. But with the treaties and um, I guess coming to now, um, we ended up here. I'm gonna dance this evening, I dance jingle. It feels really good to dance and I have three children and I like to be someone that they look up to too. So. And I know dancing for them is something positive. I enjoy dancing for them and um, the elderly people that can't dance and people that can't dance anymore. Due to whatever reason it is, I love to dance for them. Who's got the best food stand? <laughs> um, I personally like the lemonade stand the best, but I don't know about the food. They all taste good. <laughs> for Ashley and the other Powell community members, this celebration is a culmination of much planning and organizing. 
I think the planning for next year, we want to start soon, so right away. I think we just want to keep it flowing, keep it continua, continuous, um, and start doing more planning for it ahead of time. So this year, we only had maybe a four or five month jump on it. Um, I think they kind of got like the committee put together late, so that was, it was okay. It worked out, everything worked out. There's seven of us on the committee. We're always looking for volunteers to, to help, so. Um, I know a lot of the programs here in Bad River, the Bad River tribes, tribal programs, put in to a lot of work, volunteer hours, um, and then just helping with funds too. There's all kinds of things that get considered. Um, we think about our drums, like who we're gonna invite, um, the MC, everything, the sound system, the vendors, um, and really being proactive and like going out there to other powwows and inviting other people to come. Um, so we did a lot of that too this year, attending other powwows and handing out flyers and just trying to get people to come. In the past, it was a lot of work put into it. Um, and I think now that I'm older, I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be a part of planning the powwow and making it come to life, I guess. And I really enjoyed doing it this year and being a part of the team. You should just come and be present, listen, even if it's just walking around the arena outside of the arena even, just to be here. Well, everyone's welcome to come here and we, we always encourage it too. Everyone has had hiccups and most of the time these are harmless and self-limited to less than an hour. No one is certain what purpose they serve, but they come from a sudden spasm of the diaphragm. This is the dome-shaped sheet of muscle that contracts every time we breathe. When that contraction happens suddenly, it causes air to rush into your throat and it slams the vocal cords shut and causes the hiccup. Hiccups can happen for multiple reasons, some physical and some emotional. The irritation happens in the nerve coming from the brain to the diaphragm. Sometimes they can be triggered by feeling nervous or excited, stress, eating too much, too fast, drinking carbonated beverages, and lots of other reasons, including something as simple as a hair touching your eardrum or a sore throat. Hiccups that last longer than a few hours can interfere with eating, sleeping, and breathing, and if they're causing distress, you should see your medical provider. Some medicines or even anesthesia can sometimes cause hiccups. The Guinness World Records gives the longest run of hiccups to Charles Osborne of Iowa. He had the hiccups for 68 years, from 1922 to 1990, up to 40 times a minute and they stopped spontaneously a year before his death at age 97. Hiccups that become chronic need to be investigated for nervous system disorders, infections, cancer, liver or kidney disease, and other more serious causes. There are lots of remedies for hiccups and everyone seems to have their favorite. None of them have worked for everyone and they include eating mustard, drinking from the opposite side of a glass, having someone frighten you, pulling on your tongue, biting on a lemon, and if there was one of these that actually worked for everyone every time, it would be the only cure. There are medicines that have been used for hiccups and they include anti-nausea medicines and anti-convulsants. Alternative therapies such as hypnosis and acupuncture may also be helpful. Hopefully, any hiccups you get will be short-lived and at the worst, embarrassing. Remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vigno and this is Health Matters. The protection of the environment is a cause that many, if not all, Native nations support. For the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, it has meant going up against a large multinational energy transportation company's desire to have a delivery line cross their tribal lands. The Bad River Nation's intent is to protect lands that are culturally important to the nation. Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Tribal Councilman Dylan Jennings can usually be found at his workstation in the Chief Blackbird Center, the tribal center for the Bad River Nation in northern Wisconsin. There are many issues that confront the band, one of them being Enbridge Line 5 that crosses tribal lands. Enbridge, uh, you know, is a pipeline, has, a, has pipeline Line 5 that exists through our, our community. It's been in the ground there since I think about 1953 or so. And, um, you know, our community has, uh, 
has really voiced their 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 staunch opposition to having line five in in the ground here at Bad River. You know, starting in about 2016 or so, we started having listening sessions with our community members to, to basically ask them how we feel. Because as representatives, we really are you know here to serve our people and work for our people. You know, we have over 7,000 bosses to to listen to, and so. You know, we started having those sessions and overwhelmingly the community voiced that, that concern that if anything were to ever happen to that pipeline, it would be catastrophic to our way of life, to the very core of who we are as an Anishinaabek. And so, you know, having listened to our community members at those sessions and, and understanding the facts and, and knowing that that pipeline to, to this year is about 66 years old, you know, we, we made a decision in 2017, at the beginning of 2017, to not renew the some of the easements that exist across line five that are that are held tribally and so and, and then furthermore requesting that the, the pipeline is removed and, and decommissioned. In our language Mushkazibing when broken down refers to Mushkiki and, and Zibing or that that uh, some say a medicine river loosely translated others translate translated as you know kind of like the place where our medicines grow which oftentimes refers to you know more wetland habitat and uh, Bad River is very much you know predominantly wetland we're you know situated right on the south shores of Lake Superior or Gichigumi and um, you know we're very heavily concentrated with with wetland and, and habitat of that nature and so in many many junctures that line is crossing very vital and integral uh, pieces of land that that arbor um, you know wetlands that you know foster you know a lot of lot of beautiful and wonderful flora and fauna and so at one point the the pipeline does does cross the the bad river which ultimately a lot of our, our wetlands and especially the river empty into lake superior here councilman jennings is deeply rooted in the traditions of ojibwe culture he speaks the language attends ceremony sings at the drums, and dances. But most importantly, he listens to the words of his elders, especially when it comes to the advice about the natural world around him. Our elders relay that there is no price tag on everything that we were given here, everything that we have here, from the manumen, the wild rice, to the wawashkeshi, the deer populations here, to the water. Everything that's been given to us here in this place that we call home, you know, is, is uh, invaluable to us. There's no price tag, there's no monetary value that could, you know, compensate us to replace this, this very place we call home. Looking at some of these oil spills that have happened along Line 5, I think there have been over 33 spills documented along Line 5 since the 1960s. You know, we're, we're you know, not at liberty to, to discuss, you know, or negotiate with, with them. It's, to us, it's life or death. In an ideal world, in 2017, when we asked as a nation, as a tribal nation, as a tribal government, when we asked them to, to leave our, our community and decommission and remove the pipe, in an ideal world, they would have listened and they would have taken care of that and, you know, maybe started looking into alternative, alternative solutions. But, you know, that, that hasn't been done. And so, you know, as of last week, the, the tribe, the tribal government, made a decision to uh, file a lawsuit in federal court against Enbridge. Um, and you know we're very hopeful that you know in, in our uh, in our community here that uh, by uh, by protecting this place that everybody calls home that we're able to uh, to engage them in a in a good way and, and get what we need out of out of this situation which is the decommissioning and removal of line five other native communities across indian country including canada have opposed pipelines crossing their lands most notably on the Standing Rock Reservation in 2017. I think there's been overwhelming, overwhelming support from other communities for our decision and the decisions that other communities have had to make. And uh, you know, I'll just say that it's it's unfortunate in this day and age when you uh, when you stand up for these types of things, you get labeled as radicals, you get labeled as activists. Really, we don't see it like that. We really we see it as we're we're individual. You know, communities where nations that drink, like to drink clean water, we like to harvest, you know, the, the animals that, that live here that, you know, we, we subsist upon. We enjoy eating fresh fish and we enjoy, enjoy living that subsistence lifestyle and that's really what it's all about.
the concept of the seven generations, you know, is, is just plain and simple. We're always thinking to the future ones that aren't here yet. You know, our future great, great, great grandchildren that'll be, you know, calling this place home too someday and, and taking care of this place just as we have. You know, we want to hand it down, you know, hopefully even a little bit cleaner than it was, or at least as, as the, the same level of pristine that, that uh, we would have we would have liked to see too. After the Bad River Band of Lakes Pier Chippewa decided not to renew leases with Enbridge for a portion of the Line 5 pipeline crossing tribal lands, and after the band filed a federal lawsuit seeking to force its removal because of environmental concerns, Enbridge Energy has begun buying land as it prepares to reroute Line 5 around reservation boundaries. I was in Flandreau when uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed. I was in my last year in high school. I was walking down the street and I seen this office recruit. And I thought, I'm going to walk in and see what they have to offer. So I walked in, signed up, went home and told Dad and Ma. Off I went. At that time, yeah, I still wanted to be a nurse, so I joined the, the medical corps. So I always worked in the hospital when I was in the service. It was nice. Met a lot of GIs that were very nice. When we first went in, you know, we were new to the armed forces. They used to call us wackies. They didn't appreciate us being in the army, but they soon got used to us being around. We took care of the GIs. Uh, the ones that weren't able to take care of themselves, we, we helped and brought their meals and gave them a bath and walked them around. Some of them were injured, not too many, but a few came back injured. They stopped on their way en route and uh, we, we took care of them. Mike Wiggins Jr. is the chairman of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and was raised on the reservation. As chairman, he knows and understands the challenges that confront the nation, and he is committed to exercising and defending the sovereign rights of the Bad River Band. The homelands of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa in northern Wisconsin is located on 100,000 acres that covers an area roughly 20 by 25 miles, with the northern border dovetailing into Lake Superior. The enrolled membership is over 7,500 men, women, and children, with nearly 3,000 living on the reservation. Mike Wiggins, Jr. is the chairman of the Bad River Band. The first time I chose to run uh, was during a time that was kind of a difficult time for, for our tribe, and, and uh, I thought uh, we needed some leadership, and. Um, something I had thought about since I was young, so decided uh, to take a chance. My dad served on council. Uh, my mother um, raised us as a primarily a single single mom household and um, worked hard and, and always uh, set high expectations. Um, when I was young, we had uh, youth programs that were, were pretty robust. Our tribe right now is, is really trying to uh, incorporate and lift up the seven grandfather teachings. I know for for me, um, trying to remember uh, what it was like growing up in the heart of Odena in the reservation, trying to remember and, and sending the mind back uh, to just keep in mind the humility of, of being um, really in, in, a, in, a, in a service position. You know, the people uh, choose all of the council members and, um, and then we're, we're down here looking back up at them and, and our job is to try to help them, try to, to do better for our people. And so, uh, you know, humility, um, loving our people, loving our land and water, um, it's real. And, and so we try to, you know, uh, collectively as a council, you know, we, we try to do that as best we can. And, you know, there's always a, that moment you can't help and, and do everything that a person wants you to, you to do, but we try to do our best, you know. 
and then of course using our tobacco and and sending that uh, gratitude and that, that acknowledgement of how pitiful we all are uh, to the Creator. I mean, it's, uh, that, that, that's real too. Being a tribal leader is much different in the present than it was in the past. There is much more to consider when making decisions for the constituents you represent. And then there are the relationships that must be maintained with the local municipalities, the counties, and the state of Wisconsin. As far as issues uh, that our tribes facing, um, in no particular order, environmental protection, there's a long history of resource protection issues related to resource extraction. We've uh, resisted mines, we've resisted uh, the, the carrying of sulfuric acid through our reservation for mine projects in Michigan. As of late here, we're dealing with the Enbridge Line 5 issue and some of the dangers that that presents. Um, but then there's, you know, local economic development, that's a huge issue. and. Um, we have some basic infrastructure needs that are pressing, so developing uh, plans for, for new construction, getting our casino up to date and things like that. Uh, there's a lot going on right now. Gaming exists for the benefit of the, of the Indian people. It's not to try to sustain the casino itself and or the tribal government. It's really to, a, a means to an end to try to help our people. And you know, sometimes in bureaucracies, the, the, the trickle through effect of, of the sources of revenue truly making an impact in our community. Sometimes that gets tough. And so trying to keep those pathways open and, and just doing what we gotta do to, to help people is, is, uh, is something that we try to keep in a high place and, and work you know, towards. We have some working relationships with the local municipalities. Uh, you know, in, in the last couple of years, because of different issues, and, and of course there's a history of, I think of all reservations with border towns and, and the educational systems, the law enforcement realms and stuff like that. We've definitely had our share of issues, but we continue to try to work those things. You know, we, we need uh, the educational system to be robust for our children. We need them to acknowledge who our children are. Um, as far as law enforcement goes, we've definitely had some challenges and, and uh, you know, but at the same time, um, we need law enforcement and, and those types of things for the safety and the welfare of our communities. We try to stay in contact and, you know, Ashland County as an example, when we were resisting uh, uh, the, what would have been the largest open pit mine in the headwaters of the Bad River, Ashland County uh, ended up being a, a very good ally. There were some, some elders on that, that council that understood the uh, absurdity of, of exploding the headwaters of this place. And so I'm always thankful for that. That's a, a working relationship that, that is, is alive and it's gonna always be evolving and it's gonna always need attention. Chairman Wiggins understands the responsibility he holds as leader of the Bad River Band Lake Superior Chippewa. He has a responsibility to ensure the Bad River Band remains culturally and economically strong, not only for the current generation, but also for future generations. I love the fact that we're very water rich. Uh, the Bad River uh, is one system, the White River is another system that, that run through the res on the way to Lake Superior. We have the Kakagan Sloughs and all those, you know, rice beds and all that. One, one dream and vision is to get our communities uh, more, uh, more deeply connected to our waterways and, and to, you know, to whether it's boating or paddling or things like that. Um, rice camps that are once again down in the sloughs. We feel that connection to Morning Wanakonig, Madeline Island out there in the big lake. Trying to get our community back uh, to the shorelines so that they're, they're recreating, that they're fishing, they're, they're maybe um, making maple sugar in some of the river bottoms and stuff like that. It's, it's really, um, I guess maybe a humble vision, but trying to get people to remember how beautiful this place is and, and the fact that there's still so much here for everybody to partake in. And, and the fact that it, it gives fish, it gives deer, um, tea and medicine and, and uh, maple syrup and sugar and all of that, it's all still here. When I think of our strategic plan that we ran through this past couple of years, one of the top strategies was uh, Ojibwe cultural revitalization and, uh, and language. Um, and our council has been working very hard at that. The dynamics that are at work on our youth are really, really incredible. And, and so um, teaching them their heritage, teaching them their language, getting them back into the outdoors and, and how to take care of themselves. Um, you know, hunting, fishing, gathering, that, that's Mino Bomata Ziwin, that is the good life. And, uh, 
And, and a lot of non-tribal communities understand that, you know, as, as evidenced by the tens of million dollars in fishing tags and hunting licenses. We gotta get our kids into that. My message to our young people would be um, to try to learn their, their Ojibwe language, to try to learn how to hunt, fish, and gather, and, uh, and to press uh, guys like me. A 10-year-old starting today, by the time they're my age, would have 40 years of Ojibwe language learning, you know? And uh, so I wish I would have started younger. I, I hope that um, all Ojibwe people feel a connectivity when they come through here, feel a, feel a you know, the stir of connectivity when they, when they get close to Madeline Island, Moaning Wanakonig. Um, I encourage that because uh, it's a special place and we're just temporary and we're trying to take care of it and again send that into the future. So really water rich place, really beautiful place with the big lake uh, on our northern shores. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook and on YouTube. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors across Indian Country. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. We'll see you next time on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation, the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, and the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community. <laughs>